you so much, Sarah, and um, and thank you to you, Jessica, as well for your leadership putting together this event with our with our partners here. Um, as Sarah noted, my name is my name is Mohammed Sanusi. I'm the executive director for the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers. I want to offer you all this morning good morning as well as good afternoon and good evening uh, to everyone in uh, different time zones. I am really delighted uh, to welcome you all to this pivotal discussion on how traditional actors are addressing the impacts of climate and conflict, engage and conflict emergencies, specifically impacting women and girls as part of the 66th Commission on the Status of Women. I would like to thank all of our partners, including the Congress of Nations and States, the Interfaith uh, Rainforest Initiative and the Southern Africa Youth Forum for their tremendous help convening all of us here today to learn from key experts and grassroots traditional actors on the critical role traditional actors play in combating the climate emergency. In the last 60 years, more than 40% of the world civil wars have been linked to control over natural resources such as land, oil, and water. With the current track of projections, this situation is only poised to get worse with new and unprecedented impacts on the climate ecosystem, which we depend on to survive Vulnerable and marginalized populations in society are at greatest risk to climate crisis, including women and girls, the early, the elderly, immigrants and people with disabilities and indigenous people. So traditional leaders and their communities, including community leaders such as clan elders and indigenous ethnic or tribal leaders play a critical role in addressing climate emergencies that have a distinct harmful impact on women and girls. Currently, there are more than 37 million, 37 million traditional and indigenous people in living in 70 countries on six continents with unique cultures distinct distinct from dominant societies in which they live on long standing connections to you know ancestral lands so traditional people have a mutual and distinct perspective and recognition around the community of all life including respect for nature and the environment in accordance with the spiritual being and the creator Traditional actors have been on the forefront of advancing for, of advocating for action to combat climate emergencies. In 2007, the Interagency Supports Group on Indigenous Issues held a meeting hosted by the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity with the theme focused on climate change and indigenous peoples. The meeting highlighted the mitigation measures are essential to prevent further impact, which threaten indigenous and local communities vulnerable to climate change. Thus far, indigenous and local communities, including, have largely been left out of the development of mitigation measures at the national and international level. However, in their role as a stewards of the biodiversity and as a holder of local and traditional and traditional knowledge relevant for conservations and sustainable use, indigenous and local communities have a unique contributions to make in mitigation initiatives. We at the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers recognize the contribution of traditional actors and are continuously seeking ways to engage 
these actions, these actors in peace building initiatives in various contexts of the world. So th through the support of the European Union, for instance, the Peacemakers Network is currently supporting a project in Mozambique to contribute to conflict prevention, crisis preparedness and response and peace building through inclusive natural resources governance and management through resources strengthening the leadership and capacities of civil society actors, as well as preventing and addressing natural resources based natural resources-based conflict through multi-stakeholders dialogue and engagement in Mozambique. So we, we must okay. continue to address climate change through a whole of society approach, meaning the inclusion of all actors, including traditional and indigenous, and indigenous peoples. Addressing climate change is necessary, not only to save our planet, but also to mitigate its second order impacts, such as conflict over natural resources. We must all effectively ensure that our communities around the world have access to the resources needed to survive in peace. I am pleased this morning to now introduce to you Mr. Marco Olikainen. Mr. Olikainen is an Emeritus Professor of Environmental, Econ uh, Environmental Economics and current Research Director, Department of Economics and Management at the University of Helsinki. He's also the Chair of the Finnish Climate Change Panel since 2014. And the Regional Baltic Sea Panel, he's an invited member of Finnish Academy of Science and, and, and since two, in 2011. He has received multiple awards as a university teacher, as well as for his work for climate mitigation and Baltic Sea protection. So um, Mr. Olaikinen, you know, research focuses on economics of climate change, mitigation and adaptation, biodiversity, conservation, and protection of water resources. We're really delighted this morning to have such an expert with us to kick us off. So, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mohammed, and dear participant, uh, good morning or good evening to all of you. As was said above, climate change affects us all, no matter where we live, in the Arctic, tropics, or in between. IPCC warns us on many consequences, such as drought and yield losses in agriculture, and an increase of extreme weather uh, conditions. The notion of vulnerability condenses the uh, negative impacts of uh, climate hazards. It is a combination of the probability of the hazard, size of the damage, and the amount of people affected by, by the damage. It is well established, not only by IPCC, but also by United Nations, that vulnerability holds true, especially for indigenous people, elderly citizens, and women in many countries. Previous and recent conflicts and wars in the world show also that climate change and lack of adaptation may crucially contribute to the emergence of conflict, conflict, conflicts. What said above emphasizes that climate mitigation and adaptation policies as well as foreign policies alike must actively promote human rights and gender equality in all national and international fora and processes. This has been the case of my country's Finland's policy, promoting and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples and enhancing their participation are longstanding priorities for Finland's foreign and human rights policy. 
Finland gives its strong support to indigenous and environmental human rights defenders who risk their lives in order to advance their rights. Reprisals against human rights defenders can never be tolerated. That said, my country can and must do more. And today I'm happy to tell you that Finland is taking an important step to empower our Sami people voice and ability to adapt to climate change. Sami culture and traditions are embedded in the Arctic nature, which is particularly hard hit by the climate change. The Finnish Climate Act is currently being reviewed and among other things, the government proposes the creation of a Sami Climate Council as an independent, independent advisory council body, also taking into account the use of Sami language and Sami traditional knowledge. This council will have members from the scientific community and Sami community. Sami Climate Council and other Sami representative bodies such as Sami Parliament will have a clear and independent role and mandate in climate policy processes and in particularly related to the plans, climate plans established by the Finnish Climate Act. Finally, Finland has a long history in peace mediation. Our experience shows that involving religious and traditional peacemakers is very important in promoting peace and it has a crucial role in, in, uh, in our work for peace mediation. We understand that conflicts are getting more complex, building trust and dialogue is in, civil, in civil societies is essential for sustainable peace. Religious leaders and actors have an important role to play. Involving women and youth in peace processes is essential. I hope that today we can discuss and find ways of promoting the rights and the well-being of the most vulnerable people and find ways of increasing peace and security to the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco, for those wonderful opening remarks. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to now um, give the floor to the uh, welcome address from the Congress of Nations and States General Assembly, Deputy uh, Ina Gardner, Chair of the Public Accounts Committee of the States Assembly of the Channel Islands. Good time of day, everyone from um, Jersey Channel Islands. This is where I'm now. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Congress of Nations and States and Jersey Parliament. Personally, I'm British Israeli born in Kazakhstan and still have connections to all places where I have uh, lived and worked and have always belonged to a minority associated group. Since I was elected uh, to the Jersey Parliament, I supported the bill to recognize climate emergency, which just adopted two years ago, and also personal initiated primary legislation to introduce plastic bag ban. As a member of a diversity forum, I'm working with fellow forum members to close gaps in existing inequalities, which exist everywhere, even in Jersey. We can all agree that the climate change deepens existed inequalities. We are fortunate in Jersey, we don't have extreme uh, level of poverty. However, our government's own gender pay review, we found that women working for the government of Jersey are on an average 24.3% less than men. This number is higher by 5% than it was prior pandemic which means that every crisis seemingly affects more than men. Uh, the International Panel of Climate Change found that the gender inequalities are further exaggerated by climate-related hazards, and we spoke about hazards previously, and they result in higher workloads for women, occupational hazards indoors, 
and outdoors psychological and emotional stress. The analysis of uh, 130 peer review studies finds that women and girls often face disproportionately higher health risk from impacts of climate change than compared to men and boys. In Jersey, we traditionally, and it's how practical we I would like to be able to bring a bit of color, we traditionally have what we call a Goldilocks climate. You know, the story with one plate of food is neither hot or cold, but recently we had a heat waves, flooding, cold weather. Um, our houses are not equipped for these changes. Increased of cost living, higher prices of heating, poor home isolation, first affect the most vulnerable, women and children and elderly. I'm a town deputy. Uh, half of the children in my area are from minorities, low-income families. Many of them live in the, with mold in their homes. And I found that women are often stuck at home with small children as the cost of heating of homes and prison expensive choice need to be made to burn wood, coal in badly ventilated homes. None of the buildings are constructed with, for the extreme um, temperature. And the greater fluctuations of temperature, the greater energy needs for a typical uh, household. And we, my last message, we have to think ahead to start making plans for future, prolonging the weather variations outside of norm that we kind of see already across the globe. What it will be for us for 30, for two weeks to have plus 40 degrees, and it usually will not happen in Jersey, but it started to happen closing to 40. Who would we think to be more in risk? And we have to put plants now. With the scenarios above, it's important to recognize that women are inevitably less mobile, less connected, uh, and very connected to specific location, the home. And we have to provide measures to protect. As a member of the Environment, Housing and Infrastructure Scrutiny Panel, we are currently involved in the review of the proposed go um, government carbon neutral roadmap for Jersey. And our guided principle is to ensure that the carbon neutrality policies do not increase inequality. The government must demonstrate to us that it's not diversely affect the most vulnerable of our community and find the mitigation measures and as extra financial support before implementing. We all should powerfully influence our government and, I, and me as a member of the parliament as well to take substantial action that by definition change outcomes. We will make sure the carbon neutrality policy will not increase overall income inequality. And I would like to encourage you to engage with Congress, nations, and states, which uh, the first assembly will be holding the history in Belfast in October 2022. Congress, nations, and states is an initiative that is all inclusive of the most vulnerable voices of indigenous and ethnic minorities groups. Six commissions of the Congress, nations and states are currently working on creating resolutions for dialogue and many topics are related to the environment. Short and long term solutions, if and when discovered, should be shared. And this is what we are going to do today. I personally will be popping in and out as we still have the um, parliament sitting and votes. I wish all the best for today and warmest wishes from Jersey. Thank you all. Thank you, Ina. It's my pleasure to welcome our spoken word artist, uh, Rela Bihile uh, Lefoche, who is a passionate biomedical solutions enthusiast. Um, she is experienced in anti-stigma advocacy for disabilities, including HIV AIDS, um, and albinism, and she, as a poetess, uses her skill to advocate for issues affecting humanity. Currently, she is the head of the disability cluster of SEA and the chairperson of the Nadala Fatso Foundation. So a warm welcome uh, to Riley.
Um, can you please confirm that you can hear me? Yes. We or can. see me? We can hear and see you. Okay, thank you. Sun casts is her soul. Darkness, her habitation. Despair and tears, her daily bread. The wound in her soul, so deep by your medicine cannot cure. Fear cripples her very hope to see the next sun rise. Floods flooding away her children to death. The very children she cared for on her bosom. Floods killing her family. The very host of her childhood memories. Oh, woman, woman, what shall it become of you? But a spark of hope flickers within. A silent prayer she makes. Nature, can you lay down your gown, your, your guns? Nature. Can you silence your guns? Away with the floods, away with the forest fires. It starts as a flame, but burns the entire bush, hope. As cardio version resuscitates the heart, hope, resuscitates her true identity, her worth beyond circumstances, her true potential amidst impossibilities, her capacity to change existing situations. She is a queen. She is a princess. She is crowned. From the ashes of defeat, she picked her crown, a crown made not of human hands. Every girl, every woman was born with it. A crown of problem solving, a crown of endurance, a crown of love. She is crowned. Nothing is impossible for her. When poverty and famine come striking, like an eagle, she flies above with her winds of investments and savings. When floods come wiping away her crops, she runs to her storage at the mountain top. Her financial crown is fixed. She refuses to wear the garments of shame and fear. Boldly, she reports gender-based violence. Boldly, she reports all forms of abuse. She demands justice. She demands justice. She knows her basic human rights. Her ground of worth is fixed. She denies rejection as her companion. Canyon. She pushes back the stigma of being a single mother. She pushes back the stigma of being a divorcee. She has been in unhealthy relationships, but she believes in love. Her crown of love is fixed to all the girls around the world. Well done for standing. Well done for fighting. Let's stand united. Let's reason together. Let's strategize together and come up with solutions for climate change. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And you're seeing all the, the clapping both on the screen and the virtual clapping. So I think you you all moved us with, the, with those kind and inspirational words. So uh, without further ado, I will now pass it to our moderator, Tongpeng Langchar, who is from the Ao Naga tribe in India. He is a social worker from the Assam Don Bosco University. So without further ado, um, I pass it to Tongpeng. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. And uh, thank you very much for all the speakers who just came and then shared, uh, because I feel very comforting as a young fellow uh, sitting and listening to the um, points that you have shared uh, for the world and then for the people. Um, the poem really moves. And then the last lines really caught hold of me, where she, uh, she has spoken about united, let's, let's be united, let's reason, strategize, and let's really come together to work on these issues. And that's, I think, a, a way that we all must uh, go forward. Um, so today, uh, we have uh, five interesting panelists. And uh, the, uh, I, I will name them one by one. I will name them and then introduce them one by one. And uh, the first one on, the, on my list is from Congress of Nations and States, uh, Fajar, Sko Fajar Skoten Korwa. Um, she's a human rights lawyer and she's an active advocate for the protection of uh, human rights and rights of indigenous people. And she's also the coordinator for the Dutch cooperating organizations for West Papua and Pro Bono Legal Counselor of Papua Subcommission. Yeah, if you if someone could mute, yeah. Um, and then the second person uh, is uh, uh, Maggie Magua Maguape, Maggie Maguape, and she is the regional co-chair of South African Youth Forum. She is also the executive director and founder of Center for Environment and Justice and a Mandela Washington Fellow. Um, I to you too. And then uh, the third person, the third panelist in my list is like Congress from Congress of Nations and States, Bakao Hang. Um, Bakao Hang co-founded and served as inaugural executive director for Hmong American Farmers Association, a Minnesota-based nonprofit that works to promote social justice and build intergenerational and community wealth for Hmong vegetable growers. Hang, also co-founded and served as chief program officer for Boat Run Led, a national organization that trains intersectional anti-racist women to run for public office. Um, the fourth in, our, in my list is Johnston Kibor. Mr. Johnston Kibor is a traditional community leader from Regio Makarwet County in Kenya and has practical and theoretical knowledge in peace and security. He is certified mediator and um, certified mediator on alternative dispute resolution and works closely with traditional and religious leaders uh, in the larger Kerio Valley. Um, and then we have from Interfaith Rainforest Initiatives, Blanca Lucia Echeverri. She is the national coordinator of inter-religious rainforest initiatives in Colombia. She is a lawyer specializing in criminal law, criminological sciences, and national human rights law. Um, and she has a master's degree in political science and she's a human rights defender and activist. She worked for more than 20 years at Ombudsman's office where she served as a delegate defender for indigenous affairs and ethnic minorities. So uh, thank you uh, for listening to that long brief uh, introductions. So I will not delay more. Um, the first question is already in the chat box, but let me uh, read out the question for you. So the first question is what climate issue is creating environmental stress or political conflict in your community? And how does this issue impact women and girls significantly. Um, if we can have uh, 
Fajar, Madam Fajar, uh, speaking up again. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Tong Parnaga, for this uh, introduction. <clears throat> well, what climate issue is creating environmental stress or potential conflict? For the Papuan people on the western half of the island, New Guinea, um, <clears throat> the extraction of uh, natural resources is uh, the cause and a root cause also of the conflict that is already going on for almost 60 years now uh, on, the, <clears throat> on, this, uh, uh, on this island. Um, um, the, the largest gold and copper mine of uh, the world is uh, located uh, in uh, West Papua. Uh, it was discovered already in, um, in, the, in the period that uh, Western New Guinea was a colony of, uh, of the Netherlands. And after the transfer to Indonesia in 1962, um, the US owned uh, company Freeport McMoran uh, start exploitation, start the exploitation of this uh, gold and copper mine. It has uh, yeah, the most uh, resources of gold and, uh, and copper and uh, it's caused uh, deforestation and poisoning of the rivers and um, even uh, uh, through the sediment, sediments, um, rivers and a sea um, currents are, um, are, <clears throat> are, um, are changing. Um, that, directs, um, that affects directly the livelihood of the Papuan people and women and girls uh, uh, more particularly because uh, they have a vulnerable uh, position um, and don't have a say in um, the, uh, the negotiation of, uh, of their an, uh, ancestral lands. Um, we now face a, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, we have uh, 60,000 to uh, till uh, 100,000 uh, uh, internal displaced persons, mostly women and children who don't have access uh, to healthcare, schooling, education, and um, uh, because of the military conflict which is going on, because of the military involvement also in, this, uh, in these companies and in the business uh, interest, with the business interest. Um, uh, there's a beautiful report uh, from um, the uh, Papuan Women's Working Group and Asia Justice and Rights uh, Organization. Uh, it's called All the Birds Are Gone, and it's uh, uh, because of the fact that because of the deforestation, there are no birds anymore on the western uh, half of the island, New Guinea, West Papua. Maybe I should leave it there. And, uh... Uh, so uh, be, yeah, before we move on uh, to another speaker, I, I just wanted to ask this uh, a second question, a follow-up question with that, like how have you as a traditional actor uh, or in collaboration with other indigenous tribal or community actors been working to address this issue, you know, that you have mm -hmm. raised between women and girls. How can yeah. you, how can the international community support traditional actors in advancing this cause? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, it's, uh, I'm based here in the Netherlands. So um, we are here in the diaspora, diaspora uh, supporting uh, the indigenous uh, women um, <clears throat> to, uh, yeah, financial support and uh, uh, also addressing their issues uh, towards uh, international fora. And I think uh, as Congress of Nations and States, we have a, we can um, have an important role also in um, uh, repairing the imbalance between uh, the power imbalance between indigenous nations and, and states. Um, 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 because of the, uh, for, for this very moment, we do have uh, the working group on indigenous rights within the United Nations, uh, though uh, it's a states based um, um, organization. And with the Congress of Nations and States, we try to um, yeah, repair the, the imbalance and try to give the indigenous peoples uh, uh, a say in them um, and um, to, uh, yeah, in, 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 in say in them. Um, in their right to self-determination and effectively uh, exercise their right to, to self-determination. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fajar. Um, so um, the other panelists, uh, 
So <laughs> I just get carried away and then keep on asking questions. But for the other panelists also, the questions are very open. Um, Maggie, Pakao, uh, and uh, Kibor, and then Blanca. So just like I asked uh, uh, Fajar, what climate issues is creating uh, environmental stress or potential conflict? Um, I would raise that same first question for all of you. Maggie, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity and the introductions. I must mention that uh, climate change is I know a encompassing threat to um, issues of health, system security, and agriculture. And I also need to mention that uh, it is evident that um, it has contributed hugely um, to the unsustainable pro production. I'm going to, to give a case study of a district in Zambia called Chichirundu in, in the southern part of Zambia, which has been highly affected um, with climate change impacts on water. So in this district, there are two words where I physically been myself. And uh, the first word actually, um, we have seen that women and girls and also old women are walking long distances for more than 20 kilometers to access what they call as a nearest water point. And this is a shallow well. So you need to really go down deep like you're getting into the uh, underground mine to actually draw water. And then the other area, uh, this is a community where they are walking for more than 25 kilometers to access water from uh, a dam. And the unfortunate part of this area is that this dam, um, it's being used by both human consumption and also livestock, like cows, the bees, and the goats. So uh, what are some of the consequences and the impacts that we noticed when we visited these two communities? So apart from walking long distances, they have agreed to have uh, stations where um, they need, some maybe would go at, at midnight, I would say from zero one, they're able to queue from zero one to about six o'clock, and then we're having another group. So what impact it is having on the women and girls is that for the girls, they're not able to go to school because they're spending most time to fetch water to help the families. And for the women, it has also affected their families in terms of marriages, they're getting into divorce because they're not having enough time to be with their families. Secondly, what we notice is that the water that they are using because it's being polluted by the underground contamination, the young girls, they are having their teeth turning into brown because of too much calcium and they are dropping off just like that. So what we've been trying to do is uh, how can we engage the local authority in that district to ensure that maybe government can actually increase or maybe increase on the budget allocation for that area so that they may invest into um, rainwater harvesting technologies that could help this community. And then what we have done further is engaging with the traditional authority because we believe that the traditional authorities they are the custodians of the natural resources in the communities where they are. And they are very key and influential uh, in ensuring that they can engage the communities to come up with climate action interventions and initiatives such as mitigation and adaptation measures. And then also we still believe that it is important for the international community to invest in capacity building initiatives for the traditional leaders and the communities because once they're having enough knowledge and understanding on climate change issues, 
then they can be able to have initiatives such as a ecosystem restoration, biodiversity conservation, and then also come up with initiatives such as um, rainwater harvesting that could also contribute to a sustainable pr production of agricultural products and then also improve nutritional foods. So, so far, these are the challenges that we have seen, the impacts of the women and girls walking long distances, queuing for long hours, walking in the heat, carrying big containers of water and buckets. And this has also affected their daily livelihoods because they can't have any other thing to do. We all understand that water is life. There's nothing else that they can do without water. So water for bathing, water for cooking, water for any productive activity has been affected because they need to walk long hours, they need to queue for long hours. And this is something that we have also done a documentary and we can be able to share with you as soon as it is done. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, we, we move further to uh, Nakao Hang. Great. Um, thank you, Tom Peng. Um, and before I begin, I just wanna thank all the organizers of this conference and this panel for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Um, like Tom Peng said, my name is Pak Hu Heng. I'm a Hmong American. I'm calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota in the United States. I'm also a, polit um, a political commissioner for the Congress of Nations and States. And I'm the former executive director of a nonprofit called the Hmong American Farmers Association, also known as HAFA. And HAFA is a nonprofit in Minnesota that works with hundreds of Hmong farmers, many who grow between 30 and 60 varieties of vegetables on less than 10 acres of land, and they sell the produce um, at their local farmers markets. Um, when it comes to the issue, the climate issue that is creating the most environmental stress and conflict in our farming community, it is the erratic and oscillating weather patterns. For example, um, in Minnesota, we might get 16 inches of rain in under 10 minutes and this torrential rain can overflow the existing water and irrigation systems. It can create runoffs and soil erosion, destroy plants, and wipe out farms' small profit margins. On the other hand, we might also have months of no rain where crops die off due to lack of water, where workers can't harvest because the, um, the, 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 the air is too hot, and where the soil becomes so compacted and you can't till the ground. And so in this case, small farmers are especially vulnerable because the cost to dig a well can be thousands of dollars that they don't have, and many aquifers are drying up. In other words, even if they can afford to get access and dig a well, many farmers can't find water sources to, to use. So this huge swing in weather is happening more frequently and at greater extremes, and this is negatively impacting women and girls because women and girls are the ones who are in charge of the farms. They're the ones who are growing um, um, and produce and harvesting the produce. And often they are the ones in charge of finding or foraging food for their families. And so one of the things that Hafa has tried to do to support our women and the girls who are farming in our community is we've sought to uh, get farmers access to uh, land long term and in in an affordable way. We sought to educate and help our farmers learn about cooperatives, and we thought to really implement innovative financing tactics to really support their businesses. Um, you know, overall, climate change is not only proving an economic hardship for our women and our girl farmers, but it's um, introducing an uncertainty. And with that uncertainty, there's not only economic distress, but there, um, there unfortunately are times for debt. And this makes, I think, women and girls especially vulnerable because we know when women and girls are in debt, they're especially susceptible to extra types of exploitation, whether it's sexual exploitation, whether it's economic type of exploitations. So those are my words, and I look forward to more Q&A later. Thank you. Um, 
that's very interesting because I what I'm hearing from all the speakers, most of the uh, all the speakers is about water, weather, extreme weather, and then like the economic uh, challenges. I'm uh, waiting for looking forward to hear from uh, Johnston Kibor. Uh, yes. Uh, how are you all? Whatever you are, time zone. Sorry. I should be, I should be, I've been muted. Yes, uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya, FCA offices. And uh, I come from one region of Kenya known as uh, the Rift Valley, which is uh, an area that is characterized by cyclic drought and famine. And at the same time, there's several microclimates uh, zones, including a water tower known as the Cherangani Forest, which uh, you know produces uh, dozens of streams that uh, you know uh, people downstream or communities who live downstream depend on almost entirely for their livelihood, both for domestic and uh, farming. Uh, now, just wanted to, by way of introduction, of course. Uh, I think uh, it's clear to everybody that uh, my country is the only one in Africa that hosts one UN agency. Uh, that's the United Nations uh, Environmental Program based here in Nairobi. And um, that even being the case, it can only be fair and right that we get to lead by example. Now, in looking at this uh, topic, I found it to be very interesting because we now understand uh, the issue of climate change and insecurity, or for that matter, conflict. Uh, as was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers, that there is a triple nexus between climate change, disaster risk management, and security. So we, we, we have to look at them the, uh, from the lens of the degree to which they interface and reinforce each other. So uh, secondly, we need to take the whole of system approach in trying to figure out how best to combat the consequences of uh, you know, mal uh, or uh, uh, non, non observance of human practices that impact negatively on, on the environment. Uh, now, in, uh, in terms of answering question one, there are a number of uh, factors that I need to prosecute, one of which is the fragility of the environment. As I alluded to earlier, just a few minutes ago in, in the start of my intervention, is that um, this is an area that consists of an almost alpine uh, water tower or a hill. Then you have the escarpment and then Kerio Valley, which is prone to cyclic drought and famine. Mm -hmm. Most of my fellow panelists did allude to the fact that women and girls on the basis, mostly on the fact that most African countries are patriarchal, tend to suffer disproportionately from the consequences of non-observance of good practices in terms of managing climate change. And yet, ironically, they contribute very little in, uh, if you like, uh, you know, messing up our environment in the first place. Then you then introduce the issue of uh, deforestation and the way it very, very powerfully contributes to a reduction in water, water volume in many streams. And this has in many times uh, resulted in a lot of uh, intra and intercommunal conflicts, which still happen to date. In fact, the area from which I come has been 
in a manner of speaking, a conflict hotspot that traverses about three of uh, the counties in the North, Northern Rift, if not four. Uh, Elge Maragot County, Baringo, uh, and West Pokot, primarily over resources. Then there is, again, due to probably misinformation, a lot of communities try to ring fence the existing and potential natural resources, which they think you know, uh, exists or can be found in their counties without, of course, acknowledging the fact that all such natural resources are held by the government, which has a fiduciary responsibility over them. To complicate or compound a bad situation, it's a question of deforestation and illegal logging. Yes, we have a statutory body, an agency with a clear mandate to protect and conserve uh, our environment. Uh, but sometimes we get to experience on so many occasions illegal logging. It is still debatable, and that will form part of some of the interventions that we will be you know, putting forward, articulating in terms of by way of going forward, in terms of what exactly we need or we intend to do uh, to ensure that what little forest cover we have because we are at uh, around 4% against the UN recommended 10% forest cover. Uh, now, in terms of uh, soil erosion, we know that uh, the Kerio Valley is arid or semi-arid, meaning that there is very little vegetative cover. And yet, by contrast, the major occupation or lifestyle or source of income for these communities is livestock keeping. So most, you get to find that there is in so, so, so many situations, they keep the carrying capacity of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the number of uh, cattle they keep far outstrips available vegetative cover or foliage for that matter. Uh, to say nothing of the perennial water shortage, which then in turn triggers a conflict. So that in understanding the interface between conflict and environment, one has to approach it from the best uh, uh, the approach, which is a political, economic, uh, social, cultural, technological, legal, and environmental. That is the kind of holistic approach that we think should be uh, adopted rather than adopting a silo or a standalone uh, effect, which will not be sustainable, much less effective in the long run. So probably later, unless you want me to, I can proceed to, to articulate the other uh, issues. Thank you, Johnson. Right, uh, to question two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will uh, proceed. Yeah, yeah, you have not proceeded to question two, right? So because like, I thought you have mentioned the political, economic, and sociocultural plus legal uh, points, which are actually a step towards uh, uh, how we can really understand the local ground and the basics and context. Uh, Justin, uh, just letting you know that we have one more speaker, but uh, I, will, I would like to hear your response to the question number two. Yes, so we, I, I just want to build the strand on how all this uh, affects women and girls. Uh, in that, for instance, in as far as uh, prioritization of development projects are concerned, uh, women in my area still have to trek for kilometers tens of kilometers to fetch water, firewood, and uh, basically maybe even uh, vegetables, you know? And uh, this is uh, a situation that we need to, we need to reverse. Uh, at the same time, 
illiterate levels among us is disproportionately higher than that of boys. Uh, because where the two siblings, where one needs to go to school, more often than not, it is the boy who gets to go to school and the girl either gets married off. And remember, these are communities that are still uh, pastoralists. Therefore, the issue of dowry is, uh, cannot be uh, uh, underestimated or, 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 or gainsaid. Uh, in terms of access to mother and child facilities, I need to mention that uh, the, that area, region of Kenya, suffered systematic marginalization since independence. It is only after 2013 when we adopted a new constitutional dispensation that resources were dispersed from the center here in Nairobi to the counties. And therefore, those are some of the uh, policy, legislative, and, 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 and uh, statutory measures that are being taken. But by and large, because the development gap is so huge, it would take probably a few decades for those uh, marginalized reasons, I mean, uh, regions to be able to leapfrog and level out with the rest of the country. And finally, if you were to look at the United Nations Secu uh, 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 Sustainable Development Goals, the region I'm talking about scores dismally on all the 18 indices. And this should be a cause of concern and must prick our conscience uh, so that we, we, we get to see how to reverse or accelerate development uh, in that area from the climatic uh, disaster risk and, uh, and security. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. Uh, so, uh, Blanca, uh, Muchísimas gracias a todos y un saludo muy especial a todos los compañeros del panel. Soy Blanca Lucía Echeverry, les hablo desde Colombia. Soy la coordinadora de la Iniciativa Interreligiosa para los Bosques Tropicales, un programa que depende de, las organización, de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente, PENUMA, que convoca a todos los líderes religiosos y a las comunidades de fe a trabajar codo a codo con los pueblos indígenas, los gobiernos, la sociedad civil y el comercio sobre las medidas que protegen los bosques tropicales y salvaguardan aquellos que sirven como sus guardianes. Tenemos presencia en cinco países, Brasil, Perú, República Democrática del Congo, Indonesia y Colombia. En esta intervención entonces vamos a dar respuesta a las dos eh, y permítanme hablar de las dos primeras preguntas. Eh, la primera es que todos los ecosistemas colombianos están presentando tasas crecientes y, de, y sostenidas de deforestación. Sin embargo, las mayores y más preocupantes tasas por su crecimiento y velocidad se pueden observar en el ecosistema amazónico. En efecto, de acuerdo con los datos consolidados eh, por la, en la Amazonia concentra más del 60% de la pérdida de deforestación de los bosques colombianos. La Iniciativa Interreligiosa para los Bosques Tropicales Siri Colombia concentra allí su trabajo, dada la importancia vital de este ecosistema. Los procesos de deforestación suelen estar asociados a una multiplicidad de causas entre las que se encuentran la minería ah. ilegal, la agroindustria, la explotación de hidrocarburos, la extracción de madera, colonización y extensión de frontera agrícola, cultivos de uso ilícito y construcción de infraestructura vial, legal e ilegal que aumenta la presión sobre zonas de bosques no poblados 
por el avance de la frontera agroindustrial y por la expectativa de incorporarlas al mercado de tierras. Sin embargo, los datos oficiales reportados por las autoridades permiten inferir que la mayor causa de la deforestación en la Amazonia está relacionada actualmente con procesos de acaparamiento de tierras y crecimiento exponencial de ganadería extensiva. Probablemente se trate de procesos motivados por el interés de lavar capitales de origen ilícito y en los cuales participan grupos armados al margen de la ley, pero también grupos económicos y políticos tradicionales. Estos procesos se organizan alrededor de la apertura de carreteras frecuentemente ilegales. La deforestación es causa de desastres naturales como incendios, inundaciones, sequías e inseguridad alimentaria. Como de costumbre, las mujeres y las niñas sufren las consecuencias de estos fenómenos con un efecto diferencial más agudo y riguroso. El impacto de estos efectos negativos que agudizan la exclusión por razones de género se pueden percibir si se tiene presente que, según las estadísticas nacionales, el 52% de la población de la Amazonia es femenina. De acuerdo con datos de la Plataforma de Información y Diálogo para la Amazonia Colombiana, esta región presenta altas tasas de analfabetismo femenino, indocumentación y elevadas cifras de embarazos no planificados y mayores tasas de número de niños por mujer en el país. Según esa plataforma, mientras en el interior del país hay un niño por cada tres mujeres, en la Amazonia hay un niño por cada dos mujeres. El sustento familiar depende en muchas ocasiones del trabajo femenino exclusivamente. Las brechas de género en la Amazonia colombiana, de acuerdo con los investigadores de la mencionada plataforma, resultan alarmantes, pues se evidencia la ausencia de acciones incluyentes que visibilicen el liderazgo de mujeres dentro de la región. Iri Colombia ha logrado posicionarse como actor relevante en la defensa de los bosques tropicales y de los pueblos indígenas que la habitan, como resultado del compromiso social y espiritual que las iglesias, comunidades de fe y congregaciones vinculadas a la iniciativa en Colombia tienen con la defensa y la restauración del ecosistema amazónico. Se trata de un compromiso que se alimenta de la fortaleza espiritual del movimiento interreligioso y que se profundiza mediante un diálogo constructivo y pluralista entre religiones y espiritualidades indígenas. Este diálogo está presidido por la planificación transversal del enfoque basado en derechos humanos y, partic y particularmente de los siguientes principios, igualdad y no discriminación, enfoque diferencial étnico y acción sin daño. El enfoque diferencial étnico enmarca una gestión basada en el diálogo intercultural, intercultural e interreligioso colaborativo con y entre los pueblos indígenas y las distintas iglesias y comunidades de fe con base en la igualdad, la comprensión y el respeto mutuo y la valoración de los conocimientos y, saber, y saberes ancestrales. Um, thank you very much, Blanca. Um, it's very interesting to hear about the indigenous community, especially in South, especially, and then the work you are doing in Colombia. And then all the panelists, actually, uh, I'm very happy to hear uh, all that sharing and all that information. So uh, I just wanted to take a few seconds of pause just to like let it sink in for our participant uh, for our participants panelists and those who are listening to us at the moment before we jump right to the q a session um and then in that few seconds of pause i just wanted to again uh 
highlight a specific question for the panelists and then let the panelists speak in few words, just a line or sentence, because I just wanted to know from the second question, like how can the international community support these traditional actors advancing in their cause? Uh, so uh, maybe take a moment, few moments, and then like maybe I would like to have maybe one line sentence, one line answer from all of you, especially the panelists, before we head on to the Q&A session. I'll repeat the question. How can the international community support these traditional actors in advancing their cause? Can I go? So, yeah, um, I can see uh, <laughs> Johnston uh, smiling. So let me start with Johnston. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, I don't know how to uh, encapsulate that in a sentence. We have oh. a number of uh, interventions that uh, we would wish a, a shopping list, if you will, in terms of what we would like uh, the international community to do. Um, but uh, let me just say, say for purposes of, uh, for the interest of saving time, that we would like, we know that uh, there are a number of best practices in various jurisdictions and in various contexts. We, from our standpoint, have a number of almost eight in specific interventions that we wish that uh, we could have that kind of uh, partnership uh, to, to, to implement a set of projects or activities that are designed to ensure that God, gender issues in terms of climate change, disaster risk and peace are mainstreamed into any programming, development Thank programming you. in our country. Uh, partnerships and then focus on gender and then the minority committee and especially resource and policies. Uh, Maybe, maybe I will have a word from Fajar. Fajar, would you like to give a one-liner one short answer on that? Yes, First thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tongama. Yeah. Um, yes, I would uh, like to uh, stress, um, uh, as also was uh, 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 said by uh, Maggie Mwape, capacity building is very important to, uh, um, to build up uh, uh, and protect uh, the, uh, the the position of women and girls in uh, in the different countries across the world, but we do also need um, uh, yeah the holistic approach because uh, what we heard about uh, from the different speakers today, uh, access to the natural resources plays a very important uh, role in the conflicts, and so the international community should pay attention to the fact what uh, the root of the problem is of a conflict. And if that is uh, access to, uh, to these natural resources, uh, extraction of natural resources, then this is, the, this is what uh, needs to be addressed. And from there on, uh, uh, we, we, we can proceed and also um, yeah. keep going uh, further to uh, strengthen uh, the position of women and girls uh, throughout uh, the world. Yeah, thank you, Madam Fajar. Uh, capacity building and ho holistic uh, approach towards it is very loud and clear. And uh, um, Maggie, would you like to add, would you like to respond? Yeah, sure. For me, just uh, it's an addition to what I mentioned earlier. I think from my experience, many times the traditional leaders are left out in key decision making processes. So I strongly feel that it is important that we incorporate them, especially that they are close to the, to, to the communities where they are. And they are also the custodians of the natural resources, including water. So if capacity building is actually um, part of the process in ensuring that they have more knowledge and understanding, I am confident that they will actually play a better role and also contribute to sustainable 
development and climate change action at community level. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Key decision making. Uh, um, Ma'am Hang. Bakao Hang, would you also like to respond to how traditional actors could be supported uh, right. by the international community? Yeah. Well, I talked about it a little bit already. Um, and I know that for Hmong farmers, we are farming in the United States, which is a developed country. But our plight um, as small farmers resonate with many small farmers around the world, right? And I think something that international community can do to support small farmers um, is really help them get access to land. Right, and to have land that is safe, um, land that has that they, where they have ownership over the resources on that land. And I also think we have to foster um, programs like cooperatives where farmers can um, cost share and they can collaborate. And lastly, I think we have to open up revenues or avenues for people to use innovative financing, whether they're micro loans or something that we've done at, at HAFA, which is we have an IDA, it's called an individual development account. And we have a program where if our farmers can save $2,000, we find a foundation that matches that $2,000. And with $4,000, then we help our farmers get um, access to a micro loan that then they can leverage to get access to equipment to improve their operations. So I think we have to be innovative in the ways that we help um, these small farmers. Thank you. Uh, um, I could hear access of land, but at, in the end, I could hear very much about access to like having microfinancing uh, and then like a loan or a financial support, which is uh, coming out. So um, the, well, I just wanted to ask, ma'am Blanca, if you wanted to add anything else from apart from your uh, sharing, like uh, how can we, uh, the international community, support the traditional actors like in your one liner? Before we head on to the question and session, sí. there are a lot of questions. Muchísimas gracias. Yo creo que, que todo, me, me uno a las palabras de todas las personas que ya hablaron los panelistas, pero eh, creo que también tenemos que tener conciencia de que la comunidad es internacional juega un papel supremamente importante y que puede ayudar y puede ayudar con presión a los gobiernos de nuestros países. Es decir, debería tener un papel más ponderante de incidencia política para lograr y denunciar y lograr el cambio de, de leyes que están afectando la vida de muchas mujeres y de muchas niñas. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Blanca. So thank you very much to all the panelists here. Uh, now we enter the Q&A session. Um, so uh, I would like to take this. If you could uh, raise your use the raise raise hand icon, or else uh, if you could use the. I chat. have the first question in the chat from Kamala Dixon. Um, she uh, actually raises the point that in Dar Salaam that they uh, have a heavy reliance on charcoal and there's an issue of getting access to charcoal. So the question is, you know, with indigenous communities using uh, different points of nature uh, for consumption and, and use, how do we install new technologies and kind of change with the way that we supply power um, instead of using charcoal and, and other forms of um, nature's products. So how do we use new technologies to advance climate? And this is for any of the panelists. So feel free to jump in. There you go. Go ahead, Johnston. Right. Uh, thank you. It was as a pertinent question that um, we are actually as uh, identified as one of the areas in which we'd like uh, to have some partnership on. First of all, uh, it can, the Kerio Valley Belt uh, enjoys uh, high temperatures around the year, averaging 27 to 30 degrees Celsius. And if you wanted to get uh, clean and um, reliable and cheap energy, 
that would be the first natural starting point if you want to transform the lives of, first of all, women and girls, whom, as I had pointed out, are the people fetching the firewood. And then also, we'll be contributing directly to bettering their health because of the you know, smoke emission from charcoal and fire those houses. So if the extent to which we, we, we can be able to harness uh, solar power and you know, link them by you know, starting uh, solar farms, for instance, in places like Baringo and LK Maraquet, and uh, indeed, in most of what you call in Kenyan palms, the assals is the arid and semi-arid lands. Thank you. I wanted to also add something that Hafla has been doing that's been very successful is that we've been teaming up with college students. And I think one of the great things about college students is that they're young and curious and they're not necessarily marred by certain types of preconceived notions of what makes sense in business or in industry. So when they come to something like a Hafla and we say part of our problems is that maybe our, our farmers don't speak English, they're, they're more open-minded to say, okay, how can we fix that? And because it's a win when we, we want access to some of the ideas that they have and they want access to some of the, the real life problems that we have, it's mutually beneficial. And I would advocate that maybe that's one way that we could um, inject technology into some of these groups is, is by partnering up with universities and partnering, partnering up with learning, learning centers where the self-interest can be really mutually beneficial. Thank you. Any of the panelists want to respond to that or? Yes, can I respond to that also to make a note on using uh, yes. new technology? <clears throat> um, there is a, yeah, um, a bit of a problem, I think, uh, here in the Western world, we are focusing on uh, solar energy and uh, windmills uh, 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 for uh, the energy transition and reducing uh, the carbon uh, uh, emissions. But for these batteries, uh, uh, we need uh, at this very moment, uh, lithium and nickel. Uh, those are also two resources which um, uh, are limited available and um, around the world and also can cause new conflicts about access to resources. So uh, I think this is really something that we um, uh, yeah, need to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to do research also uh, with, of course, uh, uh, students and universities uh, in order how to address perhaps a new problem. Uh, <clears throat> and um, yeah, that, so that's a small note uh, that I would like to make. And of course, we have to uh, keep innovating uh, in order to um, reduce uh, the uh, damaging uh, effects of uh, using uh, yeah, the, the, the charcoal, and, uh, but also uh, in the future, maybe uh, solar energy and uh, wind energy. Mm. Thank you. Maggie, I saw your hand raised earlier if you wanted to come in. Yeah, sure. So I, I just wanted to add on in terms of land races that is leading into conflicts as a result of land-based investments. I think um, we have seen some areas in Zambia where some communities that have been displaced for more than three times just to pave way for uh, land-based investments, especially mining and agriculture. So I think it, it is important to actually share more information to our people, especially those in the rural areas to have an understanding what are their land rights. So I think something, um, I don't know other nations, but this is a huge problem in Zambia that we have seen and we are trying to engage the government to ensure that we have um, to see that our, our people do have titles to, to their lands, but there is this challenge 
where the state land and, and customary land. So for customary land, they are not giving titles. So the communities are so desperate uh, because they can be moved at any time as long as there's an investment. So such are some of the conflicts that land-based investments are bringing to the people, uh, let me say the communities, and then also impact on the environment, especially when it is um, uh, involving coal mining activities. And uh, that is what we are facing here. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. All right, I think that is um, at time for uh, the Q&A. So I wanna thank our moderator, Tong Ping, and our, all of our panelists for this really warm and rich discussion. Um, we'll be following up with any resources um, and the recording of the session. But before we close out, I wanna pass it to my colleague, Siam Toran, to talk about some of the ways that we can all stay engaged um, in some upcoming opportunities. Great, uh, thank you, Jessica, and thank you to colleagues. Um, it's really an honor to hear uh, from you all um, sharing your voices and experience and the efforts that you're leading. I think CSW is one of the only platforms within the UN that allows that space to be created at an international level. Um, for the next few minutes, I will briefly speak um, about a plan of action that the network is working on with the UN Office on Genocide and also other opportunities within the network that we would welcome you all to be a part of. Um, but before that, allow me to briefly highlight a few points. Um, this year's CSW, the theme uh, focusing on climate change, comes during a very pressing time. Um, over the years, we have come to understand that while climate change is a driver of displacement, it also increases the risk of violent conflict in fragile countries, further exacerbating conflict and displacement. Um, unfortunately, climate change is not the only crisis that we are facing, fa facing at the moment. Uh, there are other emergencies and crises um, that are happening simultaneously uh, over the past two years. I mean, we've had an unprecedented level of the sort of development. Um, yesterday, the UNS Secretary General, you know, highlighted and even listed some of these conflicts and noted that, you know, um, we have been in a way set back in our uh, goals in the SDGs by almost a decade. He highlighted gender inequality and women empowerment, of course, being the focus. And in a way, the road ahead is a bit worrisome. Um, but what we have also come to learn during these emergencies and crises is that only by working together um, can we overcome you know, some of these threats that we are facing. Um, Dr. Sanusi highlighted you know, the importance of a whole society approach. Uh, and that really encaptures that you know, we must engage everyone within the society uh, at the national, local, and uh, regional level. Today's event um, showcased some of the efforts you know, that traditional actors are leading, um, not only to climate change, but also their contribution to the broader 2030 agenda. Um, as we just heard now, uh, traditional actors have a critical role to play um, you know, in conflict-affected societies, in situations of transition, um, you know, due to their unique uh, capacity and, and trust that they enjoy uh, within the community uh, that they're in. Um, also something that was highlighted and something that we have been discussing for some time is that you know the contributions and efforts of these traditional actors uh, remain very much underutilized. There needs to be greater efforts that should be allocated towards mobilizing the capacities and ingenuity of traditional actors with of course inclusivity at the center of the approach. We must shift from working in silos and adopt a more inclusive and interconnected systematic approach from the bottom up, top down engaging track one, 1.5 and track two, which is currently beyond the uh, tr current traditional structure that we have in place within the UN and other uh, intergovernmental bodies. Uh, with these uh, elements, um, the network um, and the UN Office of Genocide came together and decided the need on developing a new plan of action uh, for traditional leaders and actors on preventing incitement that could lead to atrocity crimes uh, a similar plan of action was also developed in 2017, and that was specifically uh, dedicated to religious uh, actors and faith-based institutions. Um, and that provided uh, a series of recommendations on ways that we can contribute to prevent uh, atrocity crimes and their incitement to partnership with various stakeholders, including governments and civil society and local grassroots 
uh, actors and in, in institutions. Um, at the time, we didn't feel the need that there needed to be one specifically for traditional uh, actors and leaders, uh, because we do know that uh, there are, you know, traditional leaders uh, that also wear uh, the cap of a, a religious uh, actor or leader as well, too. However, over the years, we've come to understand that, you know, that we need a, a plan of action that also focuses on specifically the work that traditional actors and leaders lead, um, and also because of the influence that they have uh, in their communities. So therefore, drawing on the success of that very plan of actions, the Office of Genocide and the network will be launching a, a consultation process with traditional leaders and actors to discuss their ro roles and contributions in prevention of atrocity crimes and their incitement to violence. Um, the consultation process will consist of six forms. Um, the initial global forum will bring together traditional leaders and actors from around the world to discuss their role and contribution to the prevention of atrocity crimes and their incitement. Subsequently, there will be five regional uh, consultations that will take place with traditional leaders and actors in Africa, in the Americas, Asia, and the Pacific, Europe, and the Middle East, uh, which will put together a plan of actions in the context and explore the diversities and solutions that traditional actors and leaders have to offer. The objectives of the consultations are as follows. One, to deepen the understanding among traditional leaders and actors of the causes and drivers of incitement of violence and early warning indicators and mechanisms. Two, to explore the role of traditional leaders and actors in addressing and countering hate speech and preventing incitement. Sure, sure, I'm sorry about that. Um, to, second, to explore the role of traditional leaders in addressing and countering hate speech and preventing incitement to violence. Third, to initiate the establishment of a network of traditional leaders and actors who will act as agents of peace in the context of preventing violence. And fourth, to identify specific uh, contributions of traditional leaders and actors in addressing and countering violence and discuss practical and coordinated measures, including through intercommunal dialogue, something that we heard uh, Johnson uh, speak uh, very much in his remark. And, and finally, uh, to identify and discuss lessons learned and best practices. Those are our objectives for, for the plan of actions through the consultations that we will be holding. Um, the, the outcomes, of course, will be, you know, the document and plan of actions uh, that will be sort of living uh, and that will be utilized not only by the UN, but also member states and civil society. Uh, we also hope to establish a network of traditional actors and leaders uh, who would be, you know, um, addressing some of these issues. And finally, uh, capacity building modules uh, would be the third outcome that we hope to achieve. Um, the success of such a plan of action, of course, will depend on two factors uh, alone, and that is the outreach, consulting a wide range of diverse actors uh, with inclusivity at its course, and second is dissemination, uh, you know, uh, to reach uh, different actors uh, in, in implementing it. Uh, these two factors are, of course, highly dependent on your support and engagement, um, especially during the regional consultation phase. So we welcome your uh, engagement in this uh, endeavor. Um, if you're interested in you know, being updated or involved in the development of the plan of action, you can reach out to me or my colleague, Jessica, who will also be working uh, you know, on the plan of action with us. Um, that being said, although this is just one initiative uh, of the network um, you know, in empowering and working with traditional actors, the network, of course, as you know, was founded to you know, facilitate and connect uh, not only religious actors, but also traditional actors. Um, the network going forward uh, in the year ahead will be investing much more resources and exploring new opportunities with different partners, um, you know, to work more closely with traditional actors. My colleague, Rachel, uh, Ms. Rachel Palermo, uh, uh, will be sort of working on this and formalizing the structure. Um, and, and doing so, um, you know, for those that would be interested in becoming part of uh, um, the network's a membership, in a way, it gives you, um, you know, the ability to utilize some of the, the work we're doing, for example, the advocacy research and network, and also programmatic opportunities. Um, I would just like to note that becoming a member of the network does not include any binding obligation, especially financial obligation. Um, the network is solely developed and funded, uh, you know, to support uh, actors uh, at the local level. Um, and if you're interested in being any uh, with 
part of any of the work we do, uh, my colleague Rachel will be happy to support you with that. Uh, with that said, um, I end here. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, Sam. So just, I know we're at time, so I'll just briefly summarize. So thanks again to all of our partners and all of our speakers for a wonderful discussion today. Um, as a reminder for next steps of ways to get involved, we have the Congress of Nations and States Assembly in October in Belfast. Um, so if you are a representative of a traditional community, you can contact me and I'll, I'll put you in touch with the organizers. We do have the plan of action uh, meetings, both the global and regional level up and coming. So if you are working on um, conflict prevention and atrocity violence prevention, you can get in contact with my colleague Siam or I to get involved in that. Um, the next network event will be next Thursday, um, same time, um, looking at how faith actors are addressing climate emergencies impacting women and girls. And as always, if you want to join the, mem the network as a member or supporter, you can contact me or Rachel, our email address in the chat. We are looking for more traditional based um, and led organizations. So please do get in touch. And with that, I wanna thank everyone again uh, for their time. Uh, so thank you again to all the panelists and the partners for such a wonderful CSW event. If you do want to get involved in other CSW events, there's over 750 parallel events plus the official side events. So I will put the link to look at those events in the chat if that is of interest. But thanks again, everybody.